Um, but I want to thank you all for joining us here today for a very exciting, interesting chat on Intimate Command, and particularly Intimate Command training. Um, we have myself and four of other, the brightest minds in the fire industry as it pertains to Intimate Command and the fire service in general. And we're going to be doing diving into a specific case study. I'm going to butcher the name and prepping myself up of Leicester Fire Service. I'm even uh, repping the shirt here today. Leicester, was I close? Close-ish? Leicester. Leicester. Leicester, sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm just silly American. I can't speak correctly and not even speak English right. Different topic of discussion. Um, but I'm, I'm so grateful to have all of you here. Um, this is the Smart Firefighting Virtual Chat that we are now doing on uh, at least twice a month basis. And today, case study on UK Incident Command Fire Service training. And also fortunate to have Chief Bobby Holland to give us a nice United States perspective on what is United States Incident Command perspective. And we hope this is something that you guys will find very valuable. There is a chat bar on your right. So please make sure to ask questions of our speakers and we will make sure to ask them. And also if your internet goes out for any reason or if it pauses, just go to your web browser up top and just press reconnect. Um, so without further ado, I am your host here, Kevin Sofin of smartfirefighting.com. Fortunate and grateful to have all of you here. And I will now pass this over next to my co-host and fellow brother from another mother, Martin Boosman. Boosman. Again, close. But that was not bad, Kevin. Kevin, thank you very much for, for introducing me. It is uh, indeed a pleasure to be uh, with everyone here, to be uh, across the pond uh, uh, with the people from Leicestershire. Good pronunciation. Very from good. The rest, uh, from the Netherlands, actually, uh, right here. Short background about myself for the people that don't know me. I've got a background in uh, developing, designing, and, and implementing simulation training uh, since uh, 20 years. I've uh, had the opportunity to also work with the people uh, from Leicestershire who will uh, introduce themselves shortly. And uh, uh, Bobby, Chief, uh, great to have you on board. Can I ask you actually the first question? Because I'm actually going to introduce a, a station manager and a watch manager, but what is that in the US? Uh, it would be like a station captain or a battalion chief. Okay. So, um, station manager, Anthony Wild Goose, can I start with you? Short introduction and then hand over the, the floor to you. Hi, uh, yes. Uh, my name is Anthony Wild Goose. So I've been uh, in the Leicester Fire and Rescue Service for a little over 20 years now. Um, I'm currently a station manager in learning and development. And I oversee incident command, driver training, and hazmats. Thank you. Batch. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Ian Batchelor, I've been in the fire service for 31 years. 16 years of that, I was a retained or on call firefighter, which is a bit like the paid volunteer in America. I'm now an incident command trainer, and Anthony's my boss. Great. Well, then uh, let's go into this uh, incident command training across the pond with a specific emphasis on what Leicestershire actually did to go completely remote, to be able to support remote training. But before I hand over to you, Anthony, I apologize that we are completely underdressed here on the US Netherlands side, or is it you that's overdressed? What, what's up there? It's probably us overdressed. Um, we like the formal attire. This is all work attire. Um, but we are happy to dress down to make it more informal. That's what we do on uh, command courses, isn't it, Batch? Yeah, I think now the uh, formalities are over. We need to relax and make it a more relaxed atmosphere. So, excuse me, Anthony. No, so that's good. actually what you do doing a course, correct? You start formal and then you really dress down like this. Okay. Yes. yes. So yeah, for all my, American, all my relax. American friends out there, note that these guys were wearing clip-on ties. <laughs> well, safety first. Safety first. All right. Let's go into the official side. Anthony, hand over to you. Shall I uh, hit the button? Yes, please. Okay. So where is Leicestershire? Um, Leicestershire is in the centre of the UK. It's in a landlocked county in the East Midlands region. Hold on, sorry, I need That's to get all right, you. Here. Thanks, Martin. Okay, so in last year we've got a population of uh, approximately 1.2 million people. Uh, that includes 420,000 domestic premises, 
and 45,000 business premises. And we have a total of 20 fire stations. Um, our staffing model is 700 people and 562 of those are operational. Um, last year, we attended just over 8,500 incidents, um, but our fire control centre, our 999 centre, they received over 17,000 calls um, and we carried out over 1,000 uh, rescues and that's from fire, water or um, any other rescue that we needed to carry out for life-threatening uh, situations. Now, Bobby, I, I asked what we were preparing the meeting. My first question was those 8,500 incidents. Am I correct that in the US that would be largely medical, whereas in the UK that's not? Yeah, well, depending on the part of the United States you're speaking about, the call volume EMS wise is balanced out about 80, 20 fire to EMS. But we do have many fire departments, especially in the East Coast that do not respond to EMS. So the one interesting thing too, um, if you wouldn't mind, Anthony, uh, your staffing, you have operational staff. What's a particular, what's an apparatus uh, in your, uh, uh, an engine or a truck? What's the normal staffing? So for a fire engine, um, we have a minimum of four people that ride on that fire engine, Bobby. Um, it can be a maximum of five. Okay. Um, but yeah, we our, our general crew in is uh, four people for, on the fire engine for most uh, fire calls. Great. We've got a nice video uh, here uh, about uh, Leicestershire. Shall I uh, give that a run? Perfect. Let's do it. Martin, um, do you want to discuss about the incident command levels in the UK? Would that be helpful? Okay, so just to give you some overview, um, incident command in the UK, uh, we've, well, for Leicestershire for a start, just to inform you, we have approximately 225 incident commanders, and that's all the four levels which I'm going to go through now. So we've got four levels of command. Uh, we've got level one, which is the initial incident command. And then we've got level two, which is our intermediate level. Level three is our advanced and level four is our strategic level command. Um, within the UK, we have national operational guidance um, that we interpret and we implement accordingly. Um, this is established underneath the National Fire Chiefs Council, who are a committee that are under our Chief Fire Officers Association. Um, Ultimately, this is a framework that delivers policy and tactical guidance. Um, this was born out of all the old guidance that we had historically, all the old paper version of documents we had. They've all been collated and dust, dust blown off the shelves, um, all been collated and they've been put into an online only framework that all the fire services in the UK can refer to and use. So it creates a, a standard um, throughout the country. Um, it's that guidance we use in Leicestershire to develop a structured process for the acquisition, development, um, the maintenance of competence and the revalidation of command. Um, for all those purposes I've just talked through there, we use simulation. It's fully embedded within Leicestershire. So we, it allows us to provide realistic scenarios to test our incident commanders at whatever varying level of command they're at. So we use different simulation systems. So we've currently got XVR, 
we use Fire Studio and we use QuadVision's um, eSign software. And we use a mixture of all of those soft simulation systems to provide training at different levels. Instant command qualifications within Leicestershire are critical qualifications um, and they should be revalidated um, within two years. So from, from whenever your initial assessment is reoccurring within two years, you must be reassessed to maintain your competence and show you've still got the skill sets. Um, if commanders go out of date, uh, the fire engine may not be able to respond to an emergency incident. So our revalidation process, um, ultimately we check on individual's application of the incident command system in the UK. We check their decision making and we ensure that they use a decision control process that's conducive to making good decisions. Um, it's either successful or not on the outcome of those revalidations. Um, but we also, in between the two years, we do development sessions and maintenance sessions to make sure we're keeping people's skill sets high for incident command. Um, that is usually undertaken with colleagues and peers. So we have peer feedback and it gives us the opportunity to use the simulation systems to draw the learning out of the commanders. And it also allows us to have desired outcomes to be able to impart our knowledge as an instant command trainers on those commanders. Um, Anthony, allow, allow me to just to, to ask and also reflect back to Bobby. You're saying that you're using simulation both for uh, development, yeah. but in the end, uh, the simulation outcome could actually result from someone to continue or not continue on the appliance or the engine. Exactly that. So we get people that if they aren't successful at their assessment, then they will be removed from those duties of being an incident commander until they've um, undertaken a series of development sessions that we provide one-to-one -one, and then they will then be reassessed and it's not until they're successful will they be ride, allowed to ride back on the fire engine. But Bobby, can I ask you, just before we go into showing more of the simulation, just to reflect compared to, to US uh, de uh, developments? Well, we use the National Incident Management System and we do have many organizations that do uh, require a certain amount of simulations in order to be certified. Um, so in, in that regard, it, it is similar to many uh, independent programs run across the United States. We don't have a national uh, model for that. The National Incident Command System uh, run out of uh, the Wildland Group does do a uh, a system of certification, but that requires actual field experience, uh, requires a great deal of um, mentoring, supervision, uh, checking. Um, so it's a bit more involved than, than what we're talking about here. But when we're talking about a municipal model, this is an excellent model to take forward locally into areas that want to do credentialing. We would, in the United States, we would call it credentialing. So basically what they're doing is they're certifying that they're uh, officer cadre is capable of handling uh, different levels of events and they've outlined four different levels. I assume their their level one is a first arriving pretty simple event. Level two, it escalates, escalates to finally where you'd have a multiple agency, long term, you need strategic goals and you need a full command staff and, 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 and very similar to how we type. We type at one, two, and three. They've typed at one, two, three, and four. So, so far we're tracking very parallel caught uh, but what I find intriguing, and I want to keep uh, uh, Anthony going here, is the actual um, the actual program that Leicester has has, has uh, it, 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 it enculturated, and how that model could be adopted by uh, any municipality across the United States or any county across the United States with relative ease. Anthony, back to you. Oh, thank you. Um, Okay, so in terms of the uh, command, <coughs> so we've ba basically, we, we use that simulation system. Um, but what we can do, actually, I think it's probably a good ch chance to go to the video batch and we can yeah. show them how instant command is used in the, U in, in the UK, in Leicestershire. Yeah, and some of the different ways that uh, we utilise simulation.
Bobby, you may make a suggestion, like Kevin. I, I scan through the questions on the uh, on the chat, and I think there's a couple of them for Anthony actually about the incident command system in general. <laughs> Picking some of them up. Yeah, two two right off the bat, really quick for you, Anthony. Um, one one of them is about what is the process of when your incident commanders or incident trainees fail the process, and what can they do before they retake. Uh, retake this test and are there any restrictions for retaking this test? Okay, so if somebody's unsuccessful, we offer four, um, up to four sessions, one-to-one, -one, and that's one-to-one -one training from a member from the incident command team. Um, and we work on their development points that we've identified through their assessment. So it's tailored, structured program to get their skill sets up in the areas that they fell short in. And then we reassess them as soon as possible, but not until we've made sure that the development areas have been closed successfully. Um, because th there is always a line that you're either safe or you're not, and we need to make sure everybody's safe. Um, so that's our under underlying way forward. Throw out an example of a development sector. In other words, you, you, you use that term. What does that mean? Could it be size up fire behavior, building construction? What specifically would be a fail point? So it, it, generally a fail point is something safety critical. So if they've, for example, if they've gone above a fire and they've not identified the fire, the size, the location, and they've sent crews directly above it and it's it's caused in a real situation that could have cost a firefighter their life, um, then we would class that as a safety critical um, out, outcome. But there could be a number of outcomes throughout the whole of the um, assessment that determines that actually this person is fell short in so many areas that therefore it's still they're not safe um, our development bobby would be specific so if they s struggled in an area we would go and do some professional discussions we'd run some exercises with them we'd do some tabletop scenarios some desk-based scenarios we test their knowledge and understanding in those areas to make sure we upskill them before they get re re reassessed Thank you. And I, I have Can I just, sorry, Kevin, can I just add to that, please? Um, yeah, it's, for the UK uh, viewers, it's a bit like taking your driving test. You have your major problems when you take your driving test. You can only have one or two, and then your minor ones where you can have a number of. And it's the same with incident command. If you do a number of minor ones, that may sway the scales that uh, you fail. Anthony, how many times can people retake the uh, the exam or the, the, the uh, yeah, I'll call it the exam if they fail? Um, well, we just rewrite, we wrote that into our procedure, um, but once it gets to a certain number and we've, we've, we're identifying three, that then it, they get, it gets passed over to their manager and to the response um, head of op, our operational response manager for them to make a decision on how to move forward from that point. 
One, one question I have, and this, this might be a little bit more macro thinking, and I, maybe I heard, I think I might have had a conversation with Paul Spade about this, and this might be more about VR, but it does apply for simulation, is that it seems like the point of the training is to actually try and push yourself to fail. And we shouldn't, you don't want to kind of make someone feel bad that they made a mistake because it's in a simulation. We, we want them to fail in a simulation in a certain way. So what's, just, what's your thoughts in terms of how students should approach training and how they shouldn't feel bad failing? Yeah, if I can come in there, please, Gavin. Uh, what we say on our development days and training sessions is while you're here in the training center, that's where to make mistakes. This is where to learn. So when you respond to a, we call it a live incident, you don't want to be making mistakes there. Make your mistakes within the training center in a safe environment, not feel threatened, feel relaxed, learn from it and learn from your peers. All right. Bob, Bob, you got any point on that? So, yeah. so there's two other things to consider there, right? There's training and testing, right? and they're two different worlds, right? Yeah. So the training side of it is where we actually are doing two things. We're testing the boundaries of the simulation, right? Because people can bring things in that those of us in the puzzle palace creating the simulation failed to identify because the, the, the actual practitioners become the center for advanced hindsight bias. In other words, they come in and say, wait a second, yeah, you did this, but in this fire, this happened, right? The simulation only tells you what's true for the simulation. What's not, what's not true in the real world, they can, during training, that can come in and help build better simulations. The other thing to remember too is that it's really not about feelings, it's about proficiency. It, it's about excellence, it's about improvement. And that has nothing to do with your feelings. Um, what, one of the things we work on very diligently in the service and the fire service is separating those two things out. How you feel about something is irrelevant. How well you perform something is important. Um, the, 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 so in other words, when someone, you have to remember too that when someone makes a decision, they believe that decision was going to work. So in simulation, we have a chance to find out why, right? And that's the training side of it. And, and that's really, really important to remember. And so when someone does something in a simulation, we say, whoa, 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 why'd you do this? They can then go through their reasoning and, and explain why. And then we can go through our reasoning and say, well, in this simulation, these parameters, we believe this would be the outcome. And then they can, we, can, we can either uh, uh, find very good common ground, we can improve the simulation, we can maybe add some information, or we can say, wow, here, you missed this piece of information. The other thing about the simulations, which is really important, and is the introduction of new technology, right? And you were just talking about uh, AR, VR, all this other stuff. Drone technology, critical study that was done about the Bunsfield fire, they reproduced it. Seven incident commanders who are highly proficient here in the US completely botched it because the introduction of drone footage occupied so much of their working memory that forced them to abandon some of their previous information flows. So using simulation, you can start to bring in those new technologies, integrate them prior to the integration into the field and make, make for a much better outcome. Sorry. All right. Thanks, thanks uh, Bobby, for that. Allow me to just respond or make a couple of comments based on the chats and then ask one more question before we continue. Uh, thanks, Paul, Kevin, like you were saying, just uh, you can step out of the boundaries and you can just uh, restart, or as uh, Dr. Lamb says, you can create the thinking, thinking commander in the simulation exercise because you can do things over and over again. Um, question, uh, Jonathan, one uh, answer to you. Uh, yes, your uh, sorry, you have executor officer finally in New Zealand is probably in, done in exactly the same way as you just saw from the Leicestershire uh, uh, team. Question from uh, from Bruce: uh, Is there any difference in requirements for whole time versus retained? So it's the last question for now, and then we hand over to Batch. Um, so no, uh, there's no difference in requirements from whole time to retained. It's exactly the same standards throughout. Um, so they have to maintain exactly the same. Great. Batch, the floor is yours. Incident command simulation. Tell us more. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Leicestershire Fire and Rescue's 
incident command simulation suite. Um, I think it'll only be fair to show you around the layout. Uh, as you saw from the video earlier, um, when we was running the incident command, excuse me, scenarios, we've got two lecture rooms. We also have a number of pods or breakout rooms um, that we use during our training simulations or assessments. The heart of the command center is the facilitator room. Everything within our command suite is controlled from within this room. There's audio, video. Every room has CCTV and two-way audio. If we move lovely martin so having a closer look at the facilitator room uh, position one that's where what we call our facilitator or role player sits they can interact with the person who is the incident commander or taking part in the scenario via an internal intercom system and if you look at image five you can see a candidate in either a lecture room or a pod depending on what training we're doing on the day we're very diverse in which rooms we can use uh, and they can communicate between one another position two is the xvr operator uh, they carry out any commands that the incident commander wants any actions vehicles moving any equipment anything like that they can sort that out. Position three, depending on the type of development or training or assessments we're doing within the command center, we'll either have assessors or observers in the facilitator room. They can watch screen six, which is what the incident commander is looking at. And at the bottom of the arrow, there is a small screen, which is the candidates avatar laptop using xvr and that'll come to more fruition when we talk a bit later uh, number seven is all the cctv we've got around the center as i say every room has got cctv audio that feeds back to the facilitator room and we can talk to the candidates in the room and every room is recordable. Patch, allow me to just jump in for a second because the question I immediately had, I know the answer of course, but the rest doesn't. How many people are actually running your incident command simulation uh, suite? Uh, there's normally four of us. There's the facilitator, uh, stroke role player, the XVR facilitator, one assessor, and then we also have what we call a resource director because XVR hasn't got any artificial intelligence. So we have to manually sort out resources of oncoming appliances, breathing apparatus duration, what tasks are being done, how long it's going to take. So there's four of us. But are they are they part time or are they? Um, the assessors are external. They're all independent to the command team. We wanted to keep the assessors separate. They're all operational staff uh, that are working on current fire stations um, because we didn't want it to become the incident command world. We wanted it to be independent. So. Yes, learning and development are delivering this training. It would be unfair of us to then test the training. We needed an independent person. And the best people for that is the incident commanders that are on fire stations. So we've got a small number of uh, assessors that we use during our assessments. But you have three full-time staff running the centre, or three and a half, actually. Three and a half, yes. Yeah. There's only three and a half of us. I, I'm not sure if the only reflects with everyone that's listening. I think uh, to many people that are listening, that is actually three and a half full-time staff 
to continuously develop and uh, assess your incident commanders is, a, uh, is I think, to many people, a, a good investment. It is with the amount of incident commanders that we have to reassess each year within Leicestershire on a two-year two rolling program. So, yeah, the team does really well. So, Anthony, is the, are you unique in the UK with this? With this no, um, command? No, most uh, UK fire services have an incident command department with a number of whole-time allocated staff of numbering of different roles. Um, that deliver that training and do the assessments. Um, it's a standard practice throughout the UK. And is now, would they also would they also have duties uh, also within training, or specifically just incident command full time? Incident command full time. Um, wow. We work with all of our neighbouring fire services, so we're in the East Midlands region, and all of our five neighbouring fire and rescue services all have dedicated incident command departments of similar sizes. There are some services that uh, sort of flip between incident command and other aspects like breathing apparatus, driver training, water rescue. Uh, but luckily, Leicestershire sticks to incident command. Because we have many in the, U in the U.S., we have many what are called command training centers, in other words, and we do incident command training at those facilities that Houston has a beautiful one. Um, many departments, they're, they're, uh, FDNY has them, very similar to what you showed in, in various degrees of, of complexity, various degrees, you know, differing, differing levels of intricacy depending on the size of the organization. But in most of those organizations, the training staff does have other duties besides just running the incident command training center. And so yeah. um, the, the difference is in Leicestershire, you, it, it is a, it's solely, that staff is solely dedicated to incident command training on a regular basis. So I guess it, it, it brings forward the most, the most probably obvious question. After you do an AAR, after action review of a fire, do you often go back in then and try to recreate that for training purposes? So in other words, say you have a, a, a good boomer in a, a mercantile uh, and, and you have some interesting aspects, say maybe the occupancy to the right stored some kind of chemical and the occupancy to the left was doing, I don't know, Pilates classes or whatever. So some interesting problems with evacuation versus shelter in place came to play. Um, so would you try to recreate that then within these, uh, within the command training center, uh, within your uh, version of the command training center for not only training purposes, but for say testing purposes? So yeah, we've, um, we can do that, Bobby, absolutely. Um, we have also talked about using the tool to complete debriefs. So after a big fire that you could recreate the scene um, of that building and the scenario and you could get the commanders in and you could have a command discussion surrounding that so you could promote the outcomes from it um, just for the visuals uh, but yes we could replicate that so would you the, so would you capture then images from that actual scene then and use those we could capture the images from the um, building and we could use the programs to be able to upload the images whether we'd be able to um, capture the exact fire scene would See, be questionable. And I just have to interject because I love this because throughout my career, I went to millions of after action reviews, not million, well, a lot. They felt like millions. Maybe maybe it was gazillions. So, but they, I never felt like I was listening to the same fire I was at. <laughs> okay. You know, it, 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 which is always fascinating to me. I mean, I know I was there, but you know, when I hear people talk about them, in hindsight, they were either much bigger or much smaller. And then the other thing I think which is interesting is that with, with this technology, we can now start to further understand why people made the decisions they did at the time, right? Because oftentimes we come in after the fact, we know the ending, it didn't say it didn't end well, and we think everything contributed where that nothing could be further from the truth and reality. So oftentimes it's just an anomalous event or oftentimes it's an unforeseen event or oftentimes it's a, just a catastrophic event. And the predictability of it was about zero. But because after the fact, it appears so obvious, everyone thinks, well, how come they couldn't see that? Well, here's your answer, sports fans. So we, uh, we refer to that, that if we're ever looking or you hear a commander's made a decision, Bobby, that with the information available at that time, was that decision appropriate? And it's like, really hard, like you say, to, to go backwards. But with a group of peers, if you can put yourself with the information available, 
was it a suitable and justifiable decision? And if it was, we can't judge them on it. We have to go forwards. I, I, I use that argument repeatedly about my fourth wife. I just... <laughs> Let me, let me jump in quickly before we continue about the, the because that's where we're here for also the remote training. Let's yeah, jump that, back to let's the see. <laughs> Allow me to make a one remark responding to a couple of the questions on the list. We're not going to go into detail about the products that are being used. Uh, this is a generic overview of the use of simulation software for, for education and assessment. Uh, also, uh, uh, responding to Peter uh, for a second, this is really the use of simulation for education, training and assessment. It is not the use of live feeds or uh, recordings from live incidents and put them back into the scene. Uh, there are a lot of technical developments, but I actually I challenge Kevin to organize a new webinar on that uh, te te technological advancement. The current simulators, uh, simulator that Lester uses is very good at taking still pictures of buildings and quickly recreate uh, the, the building at hand and then reenact the situation. Um, question number one, um, uh, very interesting. Do you use a marking system uh, to come to the conclusion that a candidate has passed or do the facilitators take that decision? Uh, Batch, do you want to cover the marking system? Yeah, uh, we do use a marking system uh, for assessments. Regionally, over the last two, three years, we've been working on a, a standardisation of the marking system, and it's all geared around the decision control process. Uh, every, everything, really, that any incident commander makes at whatever level is all geared around the incident uh, decision control process. And then allow me to add to that that Lester has a, uh, has a very clear distinction between the facilitators that run the program and facilitate the learning and the assessment process and the assessors. And the assessors use the marking program and come to the conclusion fail or pass. And that's generally not a harsh, correct me if I'm wrong uh, from Lester, sure, it's not a harsh fail or pass. It is a, okay, We've marked you, you've, you've seen yourself act. Let's go through the assessment together and come to the conclusion. Bobby, please jump in. One point of clarification. I do want to get to the remote section, so I'll be very brief. Yep. In the United States, when we talk about marking systems, that often refers to building marking systems. Okay. So in other words, throughout the United States, you'll see buildings that'll have a placard on them of some type, and it indicates things like rain roofs, uh, bowstring truss, truss construction, okay. uh, fuel loading, um, and, and things about the occupancy which are demarcated and some of them are regional. New Jersey has a wonderful system. Uh, several other states have wonderful systems. So that may have been the reference, not marking and grading as, uh, uh, as was discussed, which is fine. I'd have to figure out where Andy comes from, but I'm, I'm, I think he was uh, uh, referring to the person, the human marking, the, uh, yeah. luckily, the, criteria, but, the criteria that we, point. the criteria, yeah. For the the criteria, that's a good point. Yeah. Let's continue because we, uh, we are looking at time. It, it, uh, it would be helpful if you guys would speak English. I would just... <laughs> with, with a Z or with an S, no. So, Anthony, what happened? Yes. So basically, you've seen how we do instant command um, and how we train in Leicester Fire and Rescue Service, but uh, things changed. Uh, COVID happened. So once uh, COVID-19 hit, our strategic managers gave us our direction, and that was to maintain incident commanders within Leicester Fire and Rescue Service. That we weren't willing to um, compromise on extending expiry dates uh, over the two years, and it was classed as essential safety critical training. Um, not all services in the UK adopted this approach, and some of them now had got to try and figure out how they're going to return to the delivery model that they used had before lockdown. Um, so the old way had to change. We got to do things differently. We got to innovate and adapt really quickly, um, very quickly being pertinent because we had commanders that were coming up to their expiry date. So we had to think about how we could do it differently very quickly. But overall, the key to our change is that it made our whole instant command training and our organization more resilient for the future for any circumstance disregarding COVID, um, which I think will benefit us moving forwards. Um, Batch will take you through um, how we innovated through the technology, which is part of the webinar. Um, so we could keep providing quality, um, essential revalidations of command to keep commanders, um, firefighters and the public safe. 
Um, we have shared our practices with all of our neighbouring services and we thank those that have assisted us during this time as well, because if we can make all commanders safer throughout the UK, then why wouldn't we? Um, so we have shared uh, a lot more. But Bats, do you want to take us through how we have innovated and uh, once COVID hit? Yes, Anthony. Um, as Anthony said, strategic management said that uh, this was safety critical. We needed to find a way to keep business as usual. We needed to find a way to clear the rooms from the video you saw earlier. The facilitator room was very busy. So the way that we come up with that was we discovered that through technology, we could remote access the computers at our command center. Uh, and that gave us the ability to not only build scenarios, but also facilitate. So that meant that we could keep key workers at home. So on the left, you'll see Adam working from home. The computers he's using, he's remote accessed the computers in our training center. So we can social distance, keep people in separate rooms. Uh, the top right hand picture is of the incident commander in, again, either one of the lecture rooms or one of the pods. John in the facilitator room is doing the role playing. He's talking to the incident commander via the internal intercom system and also handheld incident ground radios. So he's working on his own. At the bottom of the picture is our assessor who's in our observation room. Again, working in a room on his own totally remote from everybody but you can hear and see everything the incident commander's doing the only time that anybody got close to each other was when we did the one-to-one -one feedback and just going back to bobby's point earlier about reasoning that's where we discussed the reasoning of the decisions that the incident commander has made to find out whether it's a pass or fail assessment it's, it's interesting to see, Batch, that uh, we have a, a slight difference between the Netherlands and the UK with regards to the rules on social distancing. In the Netherlands, probably this wouldn't have been allowed uh, either because everybody should have stayed home. So uh, in interesting to see your next point because I think that's the next step, correct? Everybody has to stay home. You can't even come to the, uh, the training center anymore. Well, just to interject. That's on, correct. Unless there's butterfly motifs at the office, I think he's in his daughter's bedroom. <laughs> yeah, but still, the others are in the training center. <laughs> so, so here's the here's the sixty four thousand dollar question. So it appears in that picture that the incident commander has traveled to the command training center. Is that correct? That's correct. So, wouldn't the next iteration of this? at least for training purposes, perhaps not testing, but at least for training purposes, would be to have the incident commander remain at their duty station and, and available and ready for duty. Could okay. I just uh, halt you there, please, Bobby? Um, I think I'll be covering that very, very shortly. As we yeah. say in Leicestershire, it's put together, not thrown together. You'll like it. Okay, Martin, um, so we've now worked out, Bat has just explained to us exactly how we did command and we were operating partly remotely, as Bobby mentioned. We had some people in, some people at home, um, which achieved what our strategic managers wanted to achieve. Um, but initially, our development courses, our initial command courses were initially halted. They weren't seen as safety critical. It was just maintaining the commanders we'd already got, who'd already got a qualification. But I thought, can we do more? You know, I'd already got the diary, my the planning for the year for our command training sessions booked out. I got the development sessions booked in for all the commanders. So it, was there a way that we could work smarter using this technology moving forwards that we could still deliver what we promised to deliver at the start of the year? So by looking at how that could be done, we then started to innovate more using the technology, didn't we, Batch? So do you want to come on and tell us a little bit more? 
yeah um this next short video that we're going to show um the learning and development management team purchased zoom um the video conferencing we'd never heard of it we'd never seen it we'd never used it so over a few days we basically played with it see if we could break it how how would it work for the learning and development incident command team so we trialed a few different bits and pieces we found that it could do screen sharing there was breakout rooms so we had a bit of a brainstorming day and this short video finds the solution to one of our problems of the incident commander being able to move around a simulated incident rather than asking to be moved around I warn you now, please excuse my over excitement when we you found have to download the result. Them. It says download or something. Oh, you fighter. You know what? I'm only moving the incident commander. You mean that you mean you've done it yourself so you could give me that uh, facility back to move around myself? I don't I don't know. I don't know. I'm all excited. <laughs> it's really exciting to be worried. <laughs> yeah, I'm just using the arrow keys on my laptop. Well, if I, if I, um... <coughs> so I do apologise for that. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please, Martin. So once we found out that we could use this technology, that opened up many many more possibilities um how we could do current training how we could get back to doing development for the incident commanders we didn't want them to come into the command center to take a test the easy analogy is you wouldn't take a driving test without having driving lessons so we found out that we could do this totally remote the top three pictures that shows a completely is a completely empty command center nobody there top left hand picture all those computers are being uh, controlled remotely from home the bottom three pictures are our very first live 100 percent fully remote development day for our level two officers okay chris so what's going to happen is um you sat in the officer's car you've, you've just so come this off your lunch. next video that um, martin is going to play now be mobilized to an incident a lie control in the normal manner uh, i paused it to a batch go ahead i can still hear it playing Is that okay, pause, Mark? Go ahead, go ahead and introduce it. I turn it off now. Yeah. Um, so apologies for that. But this next video clip is a live development session of our level two incident commanders, where one of them is being the incident commander, working from home, working the incident commander in XVR, but he's working from home fully remote with can I just add there but with with peers and colleagues observing to provide feedback for us to provide feedback so everybody learns so it's a, a conducive learning environment um which you will see by the end of the video could also be used for assessment purposes okay martin okay chris so what's going to happen is um you sat in the officer's car you've, you've just come off your lunch um you get in your car and you'll now be mobilized to an incident by control in the normal manner okay Right. Okay. right so now that's if now you can get that remote control sorted then chris will be able to navigate yourself around yeah. so, uh, 
click on the screen, Chris. Yeah. Left click, and then move your arrow keys. Okay, yeah, that's working now. Yeah, so turn to your left. Okay, yeah, that's working now. Keep going to your left. This is good. And there's your incident. The okay. incident commander um, is in front of the appliances on the right-hand side near a telephone box. Okay. Yes, over the ship, that incident commander, do what you normally do, command support, whatever that you do as you normally get to an incident. The incident is now yours. So can I talk to people as well in the normal way? Yeah. Yeah. Hello, boss. How are we doing? Uh, which, yeah. which appliance is doing command support? We've all got a lights on here. Uh, as far as I know, boss, it, the gaffer's not set, set it up yet. Okay, do you know where yeah. it is? Yeah, it's, it's right down the, the front of these two pumps here, boss, on the right. Outside the front of the hotel. Okay, brilliant. I'll take a wander down. Thanks very much. Okay, brilliant. I'll take a wander down. Thanks very much. So, in view of time, I'm going to cut it short uh, for a second here, uh, uh, Batch. Yep. Go on. You're, uh, you're up next again. That makes total uh, sense to, to what you're doing there uh, for us, because then with a larger metropolitan or county fire service to, to enable people to stay on duty and participate in the training is, is fantastic. The other thing I would point out uh, for our American friends, that telephone box that they were talking to in the olden days, people would have those on the street corner and the phone would be connected by a cord to a device. It, it, of course, in the, mo the modern world, those don't exist anymore. And that, that, I'm just teasing you. We still have them. We still have them. God bless you. It's a great place to change your clothes if you're Superman. <laughs> yeah. But one of the advantages of the way of remote working was that we didn't have to move equipment around our county from place to place. Um, so that cut down on traveling, cut down on fuel costs. This was a great revelation um, going forward for training our retained and on-call staff. So um, we, have, we have started delivering um, level ones to stations, haven't we, Batch? So we've been yeah. in level one development days, just the same. Yeah, to we've done one today. With people on duty. Um, and the feedback we're getting is fantastic across the board at all the different levels that we've um, delivered to. It's been really so, good. So let me interject here because I, I apologize. My time is short um, at the moment. So what I like about this, and what I hi highly recommend people get in touch with uh, Batch and, and Anthony and, uh, or, you know, and, and, and find out more about how they did this technologically, is that much of the technology is off the shelf. And it interfaced seamlessly with the uh, products that you bought that enable you to create the simulations, which is fantastic. It's phenomenal. And, and I think that as, you know, COVID aside, it just makes good economic sense. It makes good training sense to be able to do things like this all the time. The other thing that I found interesting and, and, and to take it to, to the point that we spoke about a moment earlier with, with Kevin, something to think about into the future is ways to connect up these cameras that we have now on all our apparatus and sometimes on our people, body cams, that with this command staff that you have in Leicester just standing by these highly trained assessors, they could be a great assistant on scene incident commander in real time if you could feed that back. And I think that's the next piece of this puzzle that we're all moving towards very aggressively. So you've got this senior command staff with tremendous credentials and experience available to do consultation in real time. Now that you've discovered that you can do training in real time why with people remotely using off the shelf stuff, I'm sure that the next piece of it that Kevin should be putting together, not to lay more on Kevin, but I don't like him very much, so I'll just keep doing it. I'm just kidding. But that would be fascinating to see how that would work out, right? In other words, now you would have a command support staff 
to help with that decision-making process. Because as we know from reams of study, whether it's Antonio Damasio or Ensley or anybody else that D David Woods uh, on how the cognitive process works, the more hands you can put on the knife, the better decision you can make. And, and, but you have to filter that, right? You can't have 16 people talking to the incident commander, but you can have someone feeding the incident commander say, hey, the command staff said you might want to consider this or you might want to consider that. And so lovely, lovely work and, and, and absolutely a fantastic use of, tech, of, of existing technology combined with, and we've got Zoom and we've got Teams and we've got all this other technology out there that we can now basically integrate for free in real time to do training to our people, whether they're at home, whether they're on call, paid, volunteer, uh, you know, confined to quarters for whatever reason. I, I think it's a wonderful, wonderful use of technology. I, I applaud the legislature thing. I thank you, Kevin, for allowing me to be on this. And and I had a, a, a batch. I had a wonderful time, Anthony, Ian. And I, it was just, it was wonderful to be with you all. Um, but I really think that it opens our minds to the vast amount of possibilities going forward, right? So one of the things we do with uh, the older firefighters is we send them, like me, they've sent me to the home. There's gonna be a guy to come in and for a moment and change my bib and, and, and give me my, my pureed lunch. But we can now take that institutional knowledge and have these people help us contribute in real time to the decision-making process, which is fraught with difficulties, right? And all of our slideshows and all of our PowerPoints in our heads are limited by our actual experience. But if you just took this tiny group we have here and put our accumulated experience together, it's amazing. And so I'll leave you with that thought. And, and thank you to the Darley Corporation for allowing me to participate. I had a wonderful time. To, the, to, my, oh, friends yeah. in the, to my friends in the Netherlands, I, 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 oh, I've never seen your, your country. I'd, I'd love to someday. I, I've, I've, I've been to the UK and, and your country is absolutely beautiful. And I, I do appreciate the fact that we occasionally have to either kick your ass or rescue you. I'm just kidding, it's a joke, it's a joke. You, you're the finest people on the face of the planet. You're really just absolutely wonderful. And I think the other thing that this uh, brief conversation had is it demonstrates that really the differences other than a few terminology issues between our systems are very minute. Some of our appliances and tools are, are, are configured differently and, and, and that's about it. But fire behaves in a very predictable way across the globe, and, and our solutions can be, uh, you know, uh, found from pl some places that you may not think to look. So, again, thank you for having me. I apologize. I must jump off. I have another commitment, but I had a wonderful time. And, and again, thank you for having me. Bobby, thank you. Pleasure to meet you, Bobby. Bobby. Allow me to uh, take uh, we still have some time. Um, I, I want to be conscious of time. We're almost at the hour, but Martin, I think it might be, might be good. Is there anything else left in the presentation to formally finish up or can we uh, run through some of the, the, the Q and A yeah. here? Again? We've got the way forward. Uh, allow me, Kevin, for a handover for you to the Q and A so you can prepare your next question. How would you reflect on what Bobby just said to, uh, when he left? He was suggesting that maybe we should be using a body worn cameras, etc., to put more senior commanders, as he mentioned, in the ear of the junior commanders. I'd like to take him back to what he originally said about the challenge in using drone technology when that was first introduced. When, now that it's first introduced, a lot of the commanders have no idea how to use it. And simulation can be used to teach, train people to use that technology. The same is, for example, when body worn cameras or when uh, back office senior commanders are, are made available on the incident ground. Again, before you start really doing that, consider using simulation to give it a try in that safe training environment. Environment. That's uh, that's what simulation can also uh, be used for. Uh, Kevin, questions from the floor. Yes, we have a few. Um, let's see where to start. Um, is there any integration between the incident command simulation and the incident report system, like some automated input? So allow me to, uh, to answer that one. I saw, I saw the question. Uh, remember that the things, the technology that we showed uh, is training technology. It is not operational technology. So uh, questions about can we put live feeds into, uh, into the training environment? That, it could be possible, it is possible to simulate live feeds. For example, the pager that you saw it is a simulated paging message. 
uh, if there is an incident reporting system, it's possible to simulate the incident reporting system uh, inside yeah. some, some of the simulators. But remember, this is training technology. It's not operational uh, uh, technology. So integration with real operations is not the intent of a simulator that we have been looking at for training and assessment. Yep, and to, to the other question about 360 photography, 360 video, I think those are those are other things that are maybe more for sometimes the, the live streaming 360 video cameras is, is something that might be possible in the future. Um, and then there are also other training methods, uh, but important to understand that we are looking at how we can simulate, as Bobby mentioned, simulate drone footage for an incident commander to train on what that might look like. We're not actually live streaming drone footage real time to incident commander. That is something that can be done and is being done. Um, but definitely a difference between the training aspect and actual live fire incident, which, which I'm sure you're aware of, but just wanted to make sure we make that distinction. And also a question from Cheryl about how could 360 photography be integrated or incorporated into the training simulator? That is a, a, a very interesting subject. There's a lot to say about that, uh, but that is a, that I would suggest is the next webinar about the technology behind the simulation training. Uh, allow me to use the last uh, five uh, minutes uh, to uh, to ask Kevin uh, Batch, what about uh, the way forward? What does it uh, look like for you in Leicestershire? Okay, Kevin. Um, so basically, this is where we want to get to. So we want to keep moving forwards. We've got momentum with technology. We want to keep innovating. Um, what we want to achieve is to make our immersion and our re scenarios as real as possible. And if people become immersed, they make more natural decisions. And it's so it's a much easier outcome when they're behaving normal and not trying to tick a box to pass an assessment. Um, so virtual reality is our next step. That's where we want to be. Um, this was a demonstration day that we put on for our incident commanders and our, our, sorry, our strategic managers. And as soon as they put the headsets on, they were gesturing, they were pointing at things um, once they're talking to people in the environment. Um, but yes, we'd like to get multiple headsets in multiple rooms. Um, and we'd like all those commanders to be on the same incident within the simulation system. And they all be interacting with each other and communicating with each other. Um, so we're looking at the possibilities. We've not got all the answers. So if anybody does know the answers um, in terms of what we need or how to do it, then that would be really good. But Batch, we did some remote working. Um, how did we yeah. use role players with the headsets? Yeah, um, on that particular day, uh, we set up a Zoom meeting on the candidate's laptop uh, that was connected to the VR headset. So the role players who were working at home could actually see what the incident commander was looking at in the VR headset. They could talk to the incident commander via the Zoom meeting and uh, it completely surprised the incident commander who you can see or did see on screen. Um, they didn't know who was talking to them. So we can recreate exactly what we do in the command center in virtual and remote training and, it, and that's where we want to get to does it mean that you have you you've mentioned a couple of technologies that you use does it mean that you now have to choose yet another technology when you want to go to virtual reality or is the is the scenarios uh, technology that you use does it already support this at the moment it already supports it all we're doing is integrating to uh, and bobby put it perfectly actually off the shelf products um, that doesn't need any development and we've just combined them integrated them and work round how to make them work best for less year fire and rescue service really our ideal martin would be if we could have um, remote virtual reality complete remote so we could have somebody at um, a station that's far out in the countryside or rural and they could put the virtual reality headset on and we could run it remotely or from our command center and give them that virtual experience because it would be so much more immersive and uh, yeah, beneficial. 
The, the engineer in me says that is absolutely going to happen. I, I, I am sure. Uh, there were several people that asked uh, about the technology behind what you're using. Uh, we're going to answer people individually and, and connect them up to Leicestershire wherever uh, necessary. Um, Kevin, before I hand back to you, allow me to ask one more question, which also comes from. We've seen a lot of fire uh, firefighters uh, and fire officers. Is this a single agency uh, technology and approach you're taking? So no, um, just I'll talk about the developments within Leicestershire. I'm in talks with Leicestershire Police um, and to do some joint scenarios in terms of firearms um, and other scenarios that would work for them. And even our, so we work in a multi-agency group as well, so we can develop scenarios that uh, emulate flooding. Um, so we, a mixture across our councils, government um, associations and different agencies, police, ambulance, all of those we can incorporate. It's just making the contacts and uh, crossing the T's and dotting the I's. And the, uh, the technology you're using is a multi-agency. It, it allows creation of medical, yeah. fire, maritime, for example, that doesn't help Leicester a lot, but maritime scenarios, industrial, etc. On behalf of me, thank you, but uh, Kevin is the official host doing the, uh, the honors too end this yeah i there's been a lot of other questions here some that i hope we covered some that we may not have covered but i want you all to know that we will uh aggregate all the questions and make sure that we do answer them and we'll make sure that we, we provide uh both ian and anthony's contact information um because they're the thought leaders here they're the ones that are actually in the field using tech um this is one amazing example of how we're using technology today to train more efficiently and then a great example of how Bobby brought up too, how we're then using Zoom or using a webinar like this to make it even better and adapt to this COVID world, not sit here twiddling our thumbs about how life is so hard. Granted, we want to continue in this virtual chat to talk about technology, talk about opportunities. Um, so we may not have got to all your questions, but we'll make sure that we answer them all. We'll send out a video here. And I want to thank you, Ian, Anthony, and Martine. Such a pleasure, really enjoyed. Um, is, that, is that for me or for no, no, that's for the gentleman from Leicestershire. That's the only drawback of remote. You don't get the bottle of wine or the flowers. <laughs> oh, we got you something as well. Oh, thank you. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, well, any, any final final last words, Ian or Anthony, for everyone listening here? Uh, just, just from me, Kevin, um, if anybody wants add contact details, I don't know I speak for Anthony, please pass them on. Email addresses uh phone numbers linkedin please follow us on twitter on our lnd account so yeah just get in touch we're more than happy to help good man no thank you very much both it's been a great opportunity it's been nice to discuss some work that we're doing we've worked really hard over the last um year to move forward with all of our instant command so uh yeah it's a uh, positive for leicestershire and a real good outlook so thank you very much. Awesome. Well, thank you all again. Um, I'll continue to be repping my, my shirt. Leicester, Leicester. Oh, no, He's got it right. Yes. Leicester. I, I, I will never, I'll never get it right. But uh, thank you all again for listening. Continue to check out smartfirefighting.com. And uh, we look forward to having you guys again soon. Take care. Take care, bye. Keep safe.